Welcome back to Face the Nation. We are joined now by the Director of Elections at CBS News, Anthony Salvanto. Anthony, welcome back. Let's start with Bernie Sanders. Why is the math so hard for him? Well, you know, he points out that he does better, does well, in a lot of polls head-to-head -head against Donald Trump. He's right about that. But in order to get to that general election, he does have a steep hill, which is to say he needs to get about 70 percent of the remaining pledge delegates that are out there, 90 percent of all the uncommitted delegates that are out there, in order to catch Hillary Clinton. And, you know, that also presumes that Hillary Clinton's support will just evaporate. And so far, it shows no signs of doing that. So it is tough for him. He talks about maybe convincing the superdelegates when he gets to the convention. Um, he's also got a pretty he's also got a steep hill to climb there as well. Yeah, superdelegates are about persuasion, not just about math. And these are party leaders and elected officials who can support whomever they like. And right now, the majority of them are with Hillary Clinton. And again, they haven't shown any signs of switching. Let's now go to the general election map, that big map where um, just start off with reminding us where things stand in a general election, where the two parties are, what things look like going into the general election. Sure. Well, as we pivot to the general, you start to look at a collection of states where, and remember, the, the presidential election is a state-by-state -state contest, although we will see many national polls, which are useful. This is one state-by-state. -state. Now, the Democrats have, in recent years, held on to a number of states that add up to slightly more electoral votes than the Republicans have sort of reliably in their corner, which is to say the Democrats do very well along the coasts, New York, California, places with big urban centers, and the Republicans tend to do very well all around the South through the Plain States. That's where you start. But in the middle of all of that, in the middle, is our number of states, we usually call them battleground states, and we'll track them all. And these are places that are more closely divided, where the partisanship evens out, or tends to be close to even, between Democrats and Republicans. And of course, many of the times you hear them mentioned, you always hear Ohio and Florida mentioned in that, in that uh, sentence. And so that's why we've uh, started there. Right. So the election in America really takes place in about a dozen states. It's not a national election. It's really about a dozen states. You looked in Ohio and Florida. Um, so what did you learn? So one of the things that underpins that entire map, because it does tell a story, is the idea that partisans ultimately come home. They ultimately vote for the nominee of their party. Now, they do that reliably in a lot of those deep blue and deep red states that we mentioned. But the key is, will they come home in some of these battleground states? In Ohio and Florida, we already start to see that, in fact, that they are so that you get now eight and ten Democrats who've decided they're going to vote for Hillary Clinton and eight and ten Republicans, and this is important because they've talked so much about unifying the party, can he unify, who will say now that they will vote for Donald Trump. And importantly, what their, the motivation behind them is not entirely that they think that either of these folks is the best candidate. There's a big part of their motivation that says they're out to stop the other side. So let, let me ask you about that in a second. But just to, a lot of people say that Donald Trump will be like Gary, uh, Barry Goldwater in 1964, who got crushed by Lyndon Johnson. What you're suggesting is that there is a kind of systemic change in the structure, that Republicans support Republicans. And so Donald Trump is always going to get, barring some calamity, what it appears from your finding so far is that he's getting the kind of normal Republican vote already, despite all the talk of never Trump. He, he is. And what you're exactly right about the way this is shaped up historically. Now, you go back to the 60s, you go back to the 70s, even the 80s, and you would see a quarter of partisans switching over to the other side. President Reagan got a quarter of Democrats. And we saw that pattern a lot. But over recent years, it's become much more hard and fast, where partisans, if six or seven percent of them cross over, that's a big number. So you're right that this is recent and this is a phenomenon where we see partisans voting for, part, for, voting for their candidate. And um, that's right. It does appear now that Donald Trump is going to get as many of those Republicans, at least in these battleground states, to start falling into line with the Republican nominee. One of the arguments Hillary Clinton is making about Donald Trump is that he is risky. What have you found in the polling that tells us about people's tolerance for risk? Yeah, there may be some. Um, we found that a third of folks say that things are so bad that the country can afford to take a chance on its next presidential pick. And it so happens that Donald Trump is winning, dominating among those voters. Now, 
That's not everybody. That's a third. And some of those are Republicans and independents who may be looking to rationalize a choice and maybe a controversial one. But the, the thing is, for Hillary Clinton, she has to watch that that idea does not expand out, that that idea does not take hold in a wider segment of the electorate, because Donald Trump is already leading on the ability to bring change. Yeah. So Republicans have been saying to me, big risk, yes, but maybe big reward. Yep. Let's on the last question here. We're talking about the map as it's kind of traditionally been in 2012 and so forth. What are the chances that the map could change outside of these battleground states that we're familiar with? What are you looking for in terms of what we should look forward to in terms of the map changing, if it does? I, I think it's a good chance. I mean, look, if we've learned anything this year, John, it's that we should challenge our assumptions. Right. Right? It might be a whole new continent. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, so what we've got here is we're starting with a map and what we've seen from partisanship that's based on the last couple of cycles. But you start to look, again, the map tells a story about what kinds of voters each of these candidates can win. And take, for example, Donald Trump, who does very well with white working class voters. Well, if he continues that, as he did in the primaries, and there's some evidence out of these polls that he can, well, then his map could expand. He could put places like Michigan, certainly Pennsylvania, maybe even a Minnesota in play. But then the Democrats push back and they say, well, wait a second, there are states like, say, Georgia that have been reliably Republican. They're having high growth. They have a larger segment of minority voters now. Maybe we can put those states in play. So I think that that, if demographics is destiny, and that's part of whether or not this is, this is all the case, then we can start to look at maybe a very shifting playing field. And that's one of the big uh, things to watch over the next six months. All right, and we'll have you on to discuss all of that, Anthony. One other thing is we miss the Florida matchup that is in our new poll. That shows that Clinton is at 43 and Trump is at 42.